Good afternoon. Um, welcome. I am Melody Toulier. I'm a doctoral student in the School of Public Health, I'm graduating this year. So it's exciting. Um, I have the honor and the privilege to be one of the graduate fellows um, the, from, based on in the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, where we focus on issues on research on gender, race, class, and ethnicity. And um, since 1976, has been supporting students from doctoral programs to um, top academic institutions. So um, we want to welcome Juan de Lara. De, de Lara. De Lara, yes. Um, it's, good, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's to, to this. Um, and um, we just want to first thank the co-sponsors, uh, the Department of Geography, Department of Ethnic Studies, Division of Equity and Inclusion, Center for Ethnographic Research, Center for Latino Policy Research, and Center for Race and, Eth and Gender. Excuse me. Um, there are evaluations on your seats. Your feedback is much appreciated and very helpful as we plan future events. Please fill this out, um, either on paper or online. Wait, and you're evaluating me? <laughs> they are inviting the events. I didn't know that was part of the deal. <laughs> well, you're used to it, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, and uh, if you can please turn off your cell phones, that would be most appreciated. And the, the format of the event is the following. We will, um, Juan will speak for 45 minutes, after which we will open up for Q&A. And it is my pleasure to formally introduce Juan de Lara. Um, assistant Professor of American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. In 2009, he was awarded a PhD in Geography from UC Berkeley, where he was also an ISSI graduate fellow. From 2010 through 2011, he was a Mellon postdoctoral scholar, at, uh, to, excuse me, teaching fellow at the University of Southern California. Professor Dilara's research interests include social justice and social movements, racial capitalism, urbanization, labor, California and the American West, Los Angeles, and the U.S.-Mexico border. His new book, Inland Shift, Race, Space, and Capital in Southern California, was released by UC Press this month and is the basis of his talk today. In it, he uses the growth of Southern California's logistics, logistics economy, which con con uh, controls the movement of goods to examine how modern capitalism was shaped by and helped to transform the region's geographies of race and class. The title for his talk is The Contested Logistics of Racial Capitalism, How Global Commodity Chains Transformed Southern California's Spatial Politics. Please join me in welcoming Professor Juan de Lara, Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. Um, I'm, I'm kind of nervous. I haven't been in this room for like nine years, and I always was there, right? <laughs> Usually in the back, uh, listening to our tea talks uh, here at Geography. Um, and I don't usually get nervous when I speak, but somehow being back in, on this campus, in this building, in this room, uh, made me nervous. Um, and look, it's the first time I see the copy of the book. Um, I want to thank Kim Robinson for bringing uh, this book. She's with UC Press, and she brought the book today, so it's the first time that I'm seeing it, and I told her that she was going to make me cry because I haven't uh, seen it. Um, thanks for, for being here. Thanks to dear friends for, for coming to listen to me talk today. I will try uh, to be coherent and competent. Um, I want to thank all the co-sponsors. Uh, that were already mentioned. Uh, I especially want to thank the fellows, the graduate fellows uh, at the Institute, and I want to thank Christine Truss, who's here. Where is she? Where is she? Where is she? She's back there. Um, one, for the tremendous amount of uh, help that she gave me while I was a fellow here at Berkeley, um, and then also for helping to coordinate today's visit. So thank you all. Uh, and I think it's kind of cool that I have all these co-sponsorships, right? Because I think it speaks to the way in which I engage in the scholarship that I do. Everything from geography to you know ethnic studies, uh, race and gender, etc. Um, okay, so here's what I want to do for today's talk. Uh, first, I'm going to read 
two scenes from the book, and now I actually have the book here, you know, so I may actually open it and read it, um, that serve as kind of geographic postcards um, or, or representations of space that, that help me ground some of the uh, complex relationships between race, space, and capital that I discuss in much more detail in the book. Um, the second thing that I'm going to do is then try to draw some connections between these two scenes that I'm going to read, right? Um, and then uh, I'm going to finally focus on immigrant workers and how immigrant workers have organized themselves in Southern California to um, challenge some of the development uh, projects um, and development policies that positions them as precarious logistics workers and precarious logistics labor. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do in short is uh, answer three, three questions. Why logistics? Uh, why the Inland Empire? Uh, and what do these tell us about race, space, and capital? Okay. So let me begin uh, where the book begins, with the dismantling of the Kaiser Steel Mill in Fontana, California. The, this is a, a picture of the mill as it was uh, in 1943. It was built, and I explain all of this stuff in the book, but it was built by Henry Kaiser leading up to the war. Uh, it was really an attempt to not only build the material or the steel that was used for all the ships that were built, including many up here in the Bay Area through Kaiser shipyards, uh, but also position Kaiser to really become the founding uh, steel producer for the expansion of the American West during the post-war period. Right? So it's an incredibly uh, uh, important site for many different reasons. So I'm, I'm going to begin with its dismantling uh, um, in 1993. In the fall of 1993, approximately 300 Chinese workers arrived in Fontana, California, and they were there to dismantle part of the 1,300-acre Kaiser Steel Mill, an iconic industrial landscape that helped build America's Pacific Fleet during World War II and provided the material for the West post-war e economic expansion. And here's another picture. This is in 1952. Um, workers spent, these Chinese workers spent nearly a year marking, cutting, and organizing the mill's pieces into a very elaborate disassembly system. One worker would use a torch to cut off part of the old blast furnace. Another one would uh, number and label it. And all of this was labeled uh, and numbered in Chinese uh, uh, characters. And supervisors maintained a grueling around the clock shift schedule and provided a ready supply of labor by housing these workers um, in a nearby fence off compound in San Bernardino. They rented the entire hotel, built a fence around it, and essentially kept them as uh, indentured uh, laborers uh, for the year that they were there working to dismantle the mill. The workers woke up every day. They waited the turn to be bussed um, into, into the mill, uh, and they spent the day doing hard labor and, and then boarded the bus going back to their camp. And this is a picture by Alan Sekula. It's in the book. Um, and uh, his estate uh, graciously allowed me to use this picture. And I tracked it down after lots of searching and found it. Uh, and it's a picture that he took of the Chinese workers that were employed at the mill boarding the bus to, uh, to go back to their hotel, their compound, really, in San Bernardino. And buses, these buses were sometimes met by protesters. Uh, and these protesters complained that the dismantling jobs that these Chinese workers had taken uh, should have been given to local workers. Joe Perez, who was then the head of the local building trades unions, told an assembled group of protesters, these jobs don't belong to those Chinese guys. They belong to us. Uh, here's a bad picture, but a bad copy of one of the protests uh, that happened during this time uh, of the dismantling. You can see it, but damn it, we want those 300 jobs. Um, so some of the picketers that were here, uh, pictured here above, were uh, claimed to have built the mill. They claimed to have also worked in the mill and wanted to be the ones who tore it down. The protesters were really relics of an earlier era, and the mill's construction and the eventual dismantling were emblematic of the social and economic transition that took place during the shift from post-war Fordist manufacturing to post-1970s neoliberalism. So let's see here. Here's the mill. Uh, 
uh, that was taken by the Center for Land Use Interpretation uh, after it had been disassembled, partially disassembled. Kaiser's devalued buildings and downsized people were the industrial and human residue left behind by the deep changes that transform everyday lives across the globe through a process normally called or commonly called globalization. Um, so why Fontana? And why did I pick this, uh, this starting place or this sort of geographic postcard to begin the book? And mostly it's because it marks the site uh, and, uh, of when I started to think about this project almost 26 years ago. Um, I haven't been, been writing it for 26 years, <laughs> but I've been thinking about it for 26 years. Um, and it started really when I was an undergraduate at the Claremont Colleges, and I had the opportunity to take a class with Mike Davis, uh, who had just published two years before City of Courts, you know, his seminal text on L.A. Um, and you can see, uh, that's the wrong one, sorry. Oh, I forgot to show you this one. Uh, so this picture, what it shows is, um, you see here, it's hard to see in this picture, but these are the cauldrons that were used in the Kaiser steel mill, right? Um, so this is the Kaiser, the same cauldron, and these cauldrons were used in 1952 by a worker in the Kaiser Fontana plant, and these are the, the cauldrons that from the Kaiser mill that are being loaded onto a ship that's leaving the uh, Port of LA harbor on its way to China. So the, the Chinese company who had bought the mill essentially intended to send it back to right outside of Beijing, assemble it into a super giant um, uh, steel mill uh, that was then going to spur the development of Chinese manufacturing. Right? And so when you think about it, the reason I call it reverse circuits is because uh, sort of what was happening is that the mill that was the steel that was being used with these relics of the Kaiser steel mill, were then uh, being was was then being used to produce and manufacture uh, the goods, the same goods that were then coming in through the ports of LA on their way back uh, from the Chinese manufacturing plants through Southern California. Oops, here's what I wanted to show you. So this is the the book, uh, City of Courts. Um, this is a picture from uh, Davis's last chapter in City of Courts. And just so that you understand where I'm talking about, uh, I once gave a talk about the Inland Empire and DW got really pissed at me, Dick Walker, because uh, he says, you didn't even show a damn map, right? Uh, in a geography presentation. Um, so just to give you a sense of where it is, when I'm talking about LA and the ports, they're down here. And when I'm talking about inland Southern California, I'm talking about San Bernardino and Riverside counties. Okay. Okay, so here's scene two. And remember, uh, I'm going to spend some time sort of reading this and then trying to figure out and trying to convince you that th these two very different scenes are connected somehow and part of the same process. Oh, the other thing is if you look closely, you can see my big head right here. <laughs> All right. um, on May 28, 2009, a group of people gathered around a large red truck and desperately tried to stop it from plowing into a crowded intersection. The crowd was there to protect a collection of warehouse workers and community organizers who had driven a forklift into an intersection, sat down, and locked arms to block one of the busiest truck corridors in Southern California. Horns blared and traffic backed up onto three -way, uh, freeway on-ramps that fed a nearby cluster of Walmart warehouses. The truck's driver, a scruffy, middle-aged white man, grew angrier as warehouse worker supporters refused to let him through the protest line. He repeatedly revved his, en his engine and tried to force protesters out of the way by lurching his truck. And what we're doing here is trying to keep him from driving through the intersection. There were a bunch of kids in the intersection. Um, a short teenage girl, and she's here, uh, she eventually got to the front with the priest, but you can see the, the priest here. A uh, short teenage girl and a weathered old priest were the only obstacles preventing the driver from plowing through the assembled demonstrators. Both of them planted themselves directly in the truck's path. A few protesters tried to talk the driver down 
by urging him to think about the safety of the men, women, and children whose bodies formed a protective chain around the intersection. Um, but the more they appealed to him, the angrier that he got. Um, and after several frenzied exchanges, the driver finally inched the truck forward and threatened to run the priest and the young girl over if they did not, quote, get the fuck out of the way. Um, but they didn't budge. And instead of retreating, the teenager, here she's holding her sign, um, she raised, she got in front of the truck and raised her sign and it read invisible no more. Uh, and she raised it higher into the air and with a really fierce, fierce glare just stared right back at him in total silence and total defiance, daring him to, to run her over. Um, and the priest, the priest, you know, he laid his hands on the, at one point I looked over, he was laying his hands on the, on the hood of the truck and praying, right? Somehow uh, whispering to himself a series of prayers. Uh, the driver finally snapped. He punched the gas and smashed through the protest line. And someone from the crowd quickly reached over, pulled both the girl and the priest out of the way, and kept them from being crushed by the truck. Uh, but protesters didn't allow for the truck to uh, break their line. They hurriedly sort of filled the gap left behind by the enraged driver, and then they continued to hold the line for more than an hour before a battalion of police came over uh, to try to retake control of the intersection. Now, disrupting the flow of traffic uh, that day was just one of the goals that the, this, this group of workers and organizers had. Um, more importantly, what they were trying to do is that they were trying to write themselves into the narrative of the region's uh, logistics industry. Uh, they were trying to, as the, the sign that the young woman was holding and also these placards indicate, uh, move from an invisible a position in, of invisibility working in these warehouses with no windows largely hidden away uh, and trying to write themselves into the region's discussion about uh, growth and economic development Let's see here's another picture just to give you a sense of what was going on and why it was critical for them to quickly fill the line they were just you know cars backed up <coughs> onto that freeway so the stories in the book um, show that putting their bodies on the line was nothing new. They did it every day by working in dangerous conditions to deliver goods into the hands of waiting consumers. Okay, so those are the two scenes. Scene one opens up a series of chapters at the beginning of the book. Uh, and that's the scene about Kaiser. And then scene two uh, opens up a series of chap chapters about logistics. So here's the thing. Um, I spend like over a hundred and what is it, the official count now? A <laughs> hundred and sixty-eight pages, intricately laying out how these two things are connected to one another, right? Um, and there's no way I can do that uh, quickly now in the span of a couple of minutes, uh, because I only want to spend a couple of minutes to try to sort of hash these these things together. And so instead of sort of summarizing and going through and summarizing, like, okay, how does how are these things connected? I wanted to give you a sense of what the table of contents look, look like. Um, so you can see you know, this discussion about scene one, that's the space for logistics, and scene two is precarious labor. And in each of those I outline, in each of the sections of the book, I talk about, okay, how is the Inland Empire or Inland Southern California produced as a space for logistics? And I talk about global goods, I talk about retail innovations, I talk about all that good political economy stuff about consumption and production and circuits <coughs> of capitalism. Uh, in, in the second section here in precarious labor, I talk about what does this mean for and what has this meant for workers. And in particularly, I'm interested in thinking about the way in which all of this, uh, these changes in global political economy and the expansion of retail have produced new sort of uh, positions of, precari of precariousness for, for workers through the production of racialized labor markets in places like inland Southern California, uh, mostly, and what I'm talking about in, in, in these chapters is looking at temporary warehouse workers uh, in, in Southern California and how they've organized uh, to, to contest that kind of space uh, for logistics. Okay, and then the, the final part I talked about, um, and, I, and I look at uh, this 
process that I call the reterritorialization of race and class. And what I'm interested here is to think about, okay, we have this kind of global economic uh, shift that's happened, um, this huge changes in urban political economy and regional development. We understand how this becomes a racialized process through the uh, production of these uh, precarious jobs uh, in, in these warehouses. Um, and now I'm interested in looking at, okay, all of this was going on at the same time that Southern California was becoming a majority Latinx population, right? And so, I, you know, so what I write and I think about here is like, if we have these global economic restructuring taking place, changing and remapping the landscape, um, how can we not talk about uh, that as a racial process when it's taking place in a landscape, in a space that's radically transforming in terms of demographics. And I'm trying to get at how are those two things connected to one another. Okay? And that's what really drove the, the, the bulk of this work. Um, and so the three key three themes that I talk about are territorialization of race and class, logistics as a method to understand how space is produced, um, and the idea of immigrant spatial imaginaries to challenge uh, the production of Southern California as a space for logistics. Okay. And um, all of this, of course, was driven by a very simple question, a simple question that was very difficult to answer, um, but that I try to address through each of the themes that I'm talking about. Um, and this is the underlying question that really drove the work which is how has racial and spatial difference shaped the character of 21st century capitalism? And that was kind of the, the project that I engaged in by looking at logistics in Southern California um, and, and immigrant worker organizing. Okay. So I don't um, have a lot of time to talk about what I mean by the re-territorialization of race and class. I'm going to mention it very briefly in the hopes that you will ask me questions about it later so that I can drill down more specifically. Um, but I do want to sort of give you a sense of what I mean when I talk about this relationship and my interest in understanding the real, uh, how race, space, and capital are connected to one another. Um, and I go back to the same scene of the Chinese workers dismantling uh, the Kaiser steel mill. Um, and this is early, early on in the book, on, on page four. When those workers from China took their blowtorches to the old Fontana Mill in 1993, they were dismantling part of a blue-collar manufacturing economy that built up um, most uh, or many post-World War U.S. cities. In Southern California, military spending drove the region's incredible post-1940s growth and produced industrial suburbs in places like Southeast LA, San Fernando Valley, and inland Southern California. You can see um, that you know, plenty of people have written about this. Uh, Greg Heiss has written a fantastic book about how this happened in LA, et cetera. But this connection about post-war growth, suburban and especially um, industrial suburbs uh, were really fueled by this e post-war economic boom. The region's expansion continued during the Cold War years of the 1960s and 70s when defense spending lured new industries and workers into the region. And the post-war manufacturing boom had enabled an earlier generation to pursue something called the American dream. And in fact, what it meant to be middle class in Southern California was intricately linked to the production of blue collar industrial suburbs in cities like Cudahy, Southgate, Maywood, and Fontana. These suburbs were home to major manufacturing companies, many of which benefited from defense industry contracts. Defense industry contracts. This is the Firestone factory um, in, in Southeast LA. Um, they were also almost exclusively white and were kept that way by restrictive racial covenants that prevented the sale of homes to non-white residents. Um, this is a pretty famous picture of how some of these racial covenants were enforced by white residents in South LA. Um, so deindustrialization, all of this is to say, and getting to the point, that deindustrialization, including the Kaiser Mills dismantling, foretold the end of this Keynesian spatial order that made the United States and California into a global economic powerhouse. 
And one of the arguments I make is that something that often gets lost in the discussion of regional development is the role that spatial fixing or the place boundedness of capitalism has played in the production of racialized geographies. And I describe in more detail how Southern California's industrial suburbs were enshrined as a normative idea of what constituted a good life, right? Something like that. Um, by a Keynesian spatial regime that was built on racial and class difference. So one of the things that I think about and write about is like, so what happens? If we can understand the Keynesian, the post-war Keynesian order as the production of a regional economy and the production of suburban industrial landscapes as sort of solidifying the American dream, and we see what happens as part of globalization and deindustrialization as the evisceration of this kind of landscape. Uh, at the same time that a new generation of Latinx, uh, Asian uh, immigrants are, are sort of beginning to make LA their home, what, is it, what does that kind of spatial order look like? What does that post-war Keynesian order look like? Right? What is supposed to deliver this new generation of Angelinos to the good life? Right? And we can be critical, and I am, about even having this idea of a good life. Um, but that's sort of one of the, the questions that I, I try to figure out, like, what's left? And oftentimes what we hear, um, and there are people who have written about this, about uh, this kind of mutual decline, the industrial decline of LA at the same time that it's changing its ra the, the racial uh, makeup. Um, and of course, this becomes uh, a vehicle for blaming Right, those people that are moving in, especially immigrants, for sort of driving the economy down. Right? And there's this confluence between economic decline and racial shift that then leads to a kind of white nationalist supremacist politics. Right? And that was clearly happening in the 1980s. Um, this is sort of just to give you an idea of what I mean by the kind of demographic change that was taking place in LA. Um, so on. So here you have, uh, this is, these are the two figures I'd like you to pay attention to. In 1980 and 1990, um, Latinos represented about 40% of the population growth, and then that went up to about 80% between both 1990, 2000, and 2000, and 2001. And in fact, we had a series, like uh, our own version in, in Southern California of white flight as a white population declined. And that led to a pretty radical shift similar to what happened in LA County in terms of the demographic shifts that took place uh, in Southern California, where at one point in 1980, whites were 78, 3% of the population, and that's down to 37%, while uh, Latinos go to 47% uh, by 2010. How do we make sense of all this, right? The huge, huge economic change taking place, huge, huge racial transformation taking place. Well, one way to make sense of it is, as I said, to turn to um, a kind of white supremacist nationalist politics. And of course, this sounds pretty, pretty familiar, right? Given the post-Trumpian sort of uh, edict that we are ignoring blue collar white, white workers, right? Um, and these same blue collar, blue collar white workers, the blue collar white workers who essentially were the embodiment of the post-war Keynesian industrial suburbs that I was talking about, right? That were was dismantled by the sort of dismantled by the taking down of the Kaiser Steel Mill, um, engaged in a, a form of racial politics in the 1980s that combined linked economic decline with racial anxiety. Right. Um, this is in Fontana, uh, which also commonly uh, is called Fontucky. Uh, in 1981, marching through a, uh, just a neighborhood in Fontana. Um, there was a, an increase in white supremacist activity and organizing. Um, Met, Tom Metzger uh, had a, a hotline and regularly talked about the closing of the Kaiser Steel Mill as uh, a sign that white uh, workers, white blue collar workers in particular, were losing their country. Right? Uh, and again, at exactly the same time that this racial transformation was taking place. Uh, this is in San Bernardino in 1984, uh, where there's just a rash of racial violence. Um, and to this day, Fontana and many parts of the Inland Empire uh, are considered as um, these kinds of spaces of white supremacy and radical politics. 
So what does all of this have to do with logistics? Um, mainly, uh, one of the things that happened is that policy leaders um, in Southern California used these industrial suburbs, all of these changes that were taking place, the decline of industrial suburbs, as a warning to uh, residents of inland Southern California and of Southeast LA and all, and all of LA, LA County. Um, they, uh, they argued that the only way to solve the kind of economic decline that was taking place in Southern California was to invest heavily in logistics. Their argument was that if California, if Southern California could no longer be the home, uh, the manufacturing center uh, of the American West, that what it could be was the logistics capital of, of the Trans-Pacific uh, Corridor. And so they invested heavily in infrastructure, transportation, ports, et cetera, uh, to be able to sort of capture that market and to surpass uh, the Bay Area ports. Um, and that was their solution, right? The solution to the same kind of economic decline that was marked by the dismantling of the Kaiser Mill and the unemployment that came with it and the kind of uh, growing population of working poor people of color, the solution was let's invest in logistics. That's going to be the savior and the salvation of the aspiring middle class in Southern California. Michael Storper just wrote a book about that choice and what those implications were compared to the investment of the Bay Area and something like the Silicon Valley, right? But the kind of the, the, pen, the path dependency uh, that you choose, that local regional policymakers chose to invest in, had a tremendous amount, a whole series of consequences for what the landscape looked like and what the economic outcomes would be for um, the majority of the population uh, in that region. Okay. And here you give a sense of what that investment looks like. Right? This is the port of LA. I think actually this is just, uh, you know, ports of LA, when I talk about it, is both the ports of LA and the port of Long Beach. Together they're called the San Pedro Bay ports. Um, and you can see here, uh, one of the things that uh, I struggled with in the research was to think about how do we move beyond just this? How do we move beyond just looking at the ports as a site of uh, global commodity change and logistics um, to be able to capture uh, the complexity and all of the relationships that are necessary in order to produce something like this? And what this represents is uh, container traffic uh, from the ports of LA to all the different uh, metropolitan regions in the country. And so I'm, I was very interested, and again, I started thinking about, okay, the Fontana Mill, what happened there, how does this mark uh, the industrial decline? I started thinking about the sort of the growth of all of these warehouses that were taking place in the Inland Empire, uh, and I needed to tell a story that was based in that concrete reality of warehouse warehouses and warehouse workers but also one that captured this kind of very complex multi-scalar relationship uh, that was necessary in order for those warehouses to exist within these circuits of capitalism. Um, so I want to talk about logistics. What is logistics? I, I've been saying that for, uh, for a while here in this presentation, and I realized as I was also talking earlier to the fellows that one of the things about logistics is it's not incredibly clear that we know what it means, right? Can anybody, does anybody know what logistics is? What is it? Yeah, in the back. Can you kind of like <coughs> the planning of, planning of certain types of things? Maybe I'm, I could be wrong, but that's with planning, I believe, right? Maybe? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. It's like a heavily coordinated movement of goods that involves the, from the truck drivers to dispatchers to all the infrastructure that supports them. Okay. Anybody else? Sounds good, right? Logistics is heavily coordinated movement of goods, etc. Um, and that's absolutely true. One of the other things that uh, is involved in logistics is 
being able to then think about how that heavy coordination of goods uh, then allows for new kinds of relationships between space to take place, right? Um, that the highly scientific way in which logisticians uh, coordinate those goods with sophisticated computer programs, et cetera, then creates new possibilities for investment. Um, and one of the things that I show is how innovations in logistics led to um, the production of new super uh, warehouses and mega warehouses in, in Southern California. Um, the other thing that I, the reason I, buy, I brought up what, what is logistics is that there is a very specific, detailed, um, and official definition of logistics that's defined by the California uh, Employment uh, Development Department. Um, and what they do is essentially they take a bunch of economic categories, put them into uh, an umbrella and say, this is what logistics is. The, the problem with that definition of logistics is that um, temporary workers are not included in that definition. Right? Um, and so when they started to say that this was a solution to economic decline, um, they, you know, the, the SCAG and all of the different um, reports that were used to justify further public investment in logistics um, did not include low-wage warehouse workers into that definition. And, and so what happened is that you would get these reports that were saying, well, logistics is a great industry. Uh, it pays more than $40,000 $40, a year on average uh, in annual wages. Uh, and therefore, this is one of the reasons why we need to support this industry. Um, and so one of the political battles that took place was that workers had to con contest that. Right? This is why I talk about the, the contested logistics of racial capitalism. Workers had to organize around um, and to say, look, what, what happens is that the official definitions of logistics as exercised uh, and developed by these regional pro-logistics pro developers uh, and these SCAG reports and by these politicians doesn't actually include the whole story of what's happening with logistics. Okay, so um, this, this chart gives you a sense of what, you know, all the different steps that are involved in the logistics process. Um, this is actually from a patent um, that I found um, from a company who patented their, their logistics operations. Um, and it walks you through, right? It walks you, in, and what I like about this is that it really allows us to understand uh, the complexity uh, and all of the different pieces that go into um, making, uh, into sort of making sure that we get the goods that we need, right? Um, and it goes from everything from an ori origin shipper, which is where the factories and things are produced, uh, and then each along each of these steps, there are companies. You know, how does the good get from the factory to uh, the place where they're going to put it on a container, and then how does that get to the actual port of departure? And then, of course, you have this sea. You know, usually like 14 days between China and the United States. And then it's got, it has to go through customs clearance, so it has to be moved there. And then it has to go to you know an uh, uh, intermediary position, uh, holding space. And then on and on and on. <coughs> Finally, until it gets to the consignee or to the person who ordered the product. So it's a really elaborate system, and all of this. Uh, leads to, um, and each part of that, there are companies who have managed to get involved and create new systems uh, in order to make each of those steps more efficient. Okay, um, and so one of the things that I focus on is on the technologies of logistics, and that's what people, somebody was asking me, like, what's on the cover of the book? <laughs> um, so what's on the cover of the book is, uh, from another patent, when I started to figure out is that so much of this is about scientific management of data or hyper-rationalization uh, of, of, of the movement of goods, that these companies constantly create new kinds of technologies to, to sort of get a, um, an advantage over their competitors. Um, and as I was looking through, uh, I, I saw this drawing, and then I remembered that one of the workers that I had talked to uh, had told me that they had one of these handheld scanners. 
And what this is essentially is a handheld scanner that a worker is using uh, in order to scan boxes. Right? Um, and these technologies are incredibly important uh, because they completely revamp the way that warehouse work is done. What it allowed for is, um, you know, for also for the management of, of work uh, in these workplaces, it allowed for quota systems, it allowed for uh, supervisors to be able to better monitor how many boxes each worker is scanning, right? Uh, and so they are able then to keep track and enforce their quota systems because these technologies make that more possible. Okay. Um, and here is another innovation. We don't think about buildings as innovations a lot of times, but one of the things that is, was clear, and it's clear, is that the actual construction of the warehouse uh, as a physical space was also a key innovation in logistics. This is called a cross-dock system. Has anybody ever worked in a warehouse? Where did, where did you work? It was in New York, in the garment truck. Ah, interesting. And so did you pull stuff and then just store it for a while, or how did that work? Yeah, the uh, over-the-road trucks would kind of bring stuff in, we'd put it on the platform and then load it on the uh, local trucks. Oh, so you'd immediately load them onto trucks? Well, sometimes we'd wait, wait a day or two. Wait a day or two. Yeah. Okay, so that waiting a day or two means the circulation of goods and capital is not happening, right? And so the whole point of things like this, a cross dock, this is a prototype of a cross dock facility, is to get goods from the ports and immediately put them on to trucks that are then headed to market, right? Um, and again, all of this is about, you know, I learned this in this classroom. <laughs> right? What is that? It's about profit, right? And so the idea is that, you know, this circulation of capital that leads to profit happens, um, uh, and there's always a rush to try to make this circuit quicker and quicker and quicker, right? Does anybody shop at H&M? Hazara? Okay. So the whole, the whole purpose or the whole rash business rationale of H&M is called fast fashion, right? So you buy stuff and you buy more of it and it's so cheap that you buy more of it so that this circulation of profit is supposed to increase. Same thing here, right? This means eliminate the storage facility. You don't let it sit on the shelves. You move it directly into the truck, send it to the market, and make sure that it gets sold so that the investor and the producer can make their money. Right? So the actual physical spaces in these warehouses were part of the innovation that changed as part of uh, the logistics uh, rev revolution that made uh, all of this growth of the warehouses possible. And here's another, another system that I wanted to show you. Um, this is, um, when I was talking to some of the workers, they would tell me, you know what, like, we don't actually have supervisors to tell us what to do. All of this work is done through computers, and the computers are telling us what to do. Right? Um, and, and I was talking to them, and I'm like, what, what do you mean the computers are telling you what to do? And what they said is, like, you know, they have this pad, this iPad-like device, and that tells them where they have to go and get all the goods that they have to get. Pull them from these holding bays. Some of the facilities do have holding bays. Pull them from the holding, holding bays, put them in boxes, and then put them on a truck. Um, so each of these you know, has sensors, some kind of electronic sensor. Uh, all of it allows the main supervisor or, and, the, and the company logistics people to be able to track and monitor the productivity of each individual worker. Right. So again, in each of these cases, my interest started to become, okay, what is the role of these logistics technologies in the um, change and the transformation of work? And what I found that uh, instead of thinking about temporary workers as sort of, um, so when, the worker, when temporary workers started talking about how you know, they were paid low wages, um, uh, pro-logistic developers and politicians would say, well, they're just a very small section of the workforce. And what they do is actually not very important to logistics, right? The, the value in logistics is the high-end skilled jobs. Right? 
and therefore they should stop being temporary workers and they should start going to school to become logisticians, right? Um, and what I found instead is that the very nature of this just-in-time logistics industry that sort of is embodied in, in this, right? So the idea that you don't hold any goods, the very nature of this just-in-time logistics depends on contingent work depends on, on temporary workers. Um, and especially if you can get temporary workers that are undocumented, that are hired through uh, temporary agencies, um, that can you know, be forced to wait for the trucks off the clock until the trucks get there, and then the trucks get there, and then they get on the clock, and they're only paid for the hours or the minutes that they're actually working unloading these trucks. And so instead of being non-important uh, and marginal workers, uh, one of the things that um, I found is that in fact temporary logistics workers are central to the expansion of uh, logistics and just-in-time distribution systems in Southern California. Okay. Okay. I want to end uh, today by thinking about uh, and focusing on uh, the importance of worker organizing um, and the idea that these workers were um, organizing not just to sort of talk about wages and working conditions, but organizing really to, to change the, the notion of what development should be. Um, and one of the things that I look at is uh, the idea of testimonials, the idea of being able to position yourself or to tell the story uh, worker and sort of center the story of these temporary workers to challenge the dominant development discourse um, that was being used to support logistics organizing. Um, and so the idea that these workers were sort of were organizing around this concept of invisible no more was also an, a bit, uh, sort of an attempt to try to, as I said at the beginning, to write themselves into the narrative of economic development and region of world. Um, and so stories and telling stories became a really important part of the organizing that took place. Um, and I remember going into, um, into some of these uh, meetings with workers, and the whole, the whole meeting was about workers getting up and talking about their, not only their conditions inside of their workplace, but their sort of personal histories about why they migrated to the United States, right? And what they were trying to uh, do in taking that, making that decision to bring their families to the United States. And there was one particular woman, her name was Marta, and I, and I write about her uh, in, in, in one of the chapters. And Marta's story was particularly important to me because she told me, as we were sitting um, in her, in, at her kitchen, she told me that when she was you know, 16 years old, um, she was in El Salvador and she was working in a Walmart uh, plant there. Not directly for Walmart, but making clothes. Right? And she was working in a garment manufacturing uh, uh, facility for Walmart. And so life was hard, conditions were hard, Walmart you know, uh, was a terrible employer according to her, uh, and uh, she was coming to the United States thinking that she was going to pursue a better life. She gets to the United States, she gets to Southern California, she was looking for a job. People tell her the only way you're going to get a job here as an undocumented immigrant is to go and look for a work in temporary um, agencies. So she goes to a temporary agency, um, and she applies for a job, um, and they tell her, we have a job for you. And she shows up the job, she's excited, she thinks, my life is going to change now, I migrated to the United States, I have this opportunity to have a job. She shows up to the job, and the first thing she sees is Walmart right, on the walls of this warehouse. Um, and she talks about how her personal story and her sort of personal history with Walmart and the terrible working conditions she faced as, as a worker, as a garment worker in El Salvador, um, 
were just as bad, right? It was just as bad to work in the facility in Wong, at, at the distribution center, the warehouse uh, in, in the United States, as it was working in the garment center uh, for Walmart and Salvador. And so she realized that instead of buying into this idea of the American dream of like, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, you know, this very individualistic notion about I'm gonna go and I'm gonna sort of work hard and I'm gonna be able to support my family, that that wasn't going to work, that it wasn't going to function that way. Um, and so instead of organizing uh, just to improve her conditions and her wages, she started organizing to improve the wages across the board and in the region for all the warehouse workers uh, in the Young Empire. And what was fascinating about this campaign, for me anyways, is that it wasn't just about a group of workers from one warehouse that wanted to organize to improve their working conditions in that warehouse. Um, what they were arguing for and what these group of workers that were protesting uh, in that scene, what they were saying is that that whole notion that the solution to the crisis of deindustrialization and to the crisis of a growing population, a blue collar population that needs living wages, the idea that logistics is gonna solve that problem and it's gonna provide a path to the middle class is <coughs> false. Because it's based on uh, sort of the argument that logistics is already a, a good industry and that it already provides good wages. Um, and so instead of making that, so instead of sort of taking that on, they said, well, we need to change the way that we think about economic development. We need to change the way that we think about logistics and what kind of industry it is, and force these companies instead to pay living wages and to improve the working conditions of these workers. Um, and so the whole campaign was about these workers going around using their personal stories to try to convince people that it wasn't about a particular warehouse, a particular uh, company, that it was really about challenging the very notion of regional development based on this logistics model that itself was based on the exploitation and the hyper-exploitation of temporary labor workers. Um, and what was powerful about this campaign for me and, and what I write more about in the book is that it was mostly immigrant women that were leading this campaign. Um, and the, the transformation that I was able to see as they went from you know, being temporary warehouse workers to being leaders in these regional campaigns and to sort of confronting the kind of logistics uh, industry supporters that were sort of driving regional development uh, was incredibly powerful. Um, and Anyways, I'm going to end there, and I can have the questions. Thank you. All right. Anybody questions? Yes. Um, in your uh, formula for profit. Yes. Uh, in logistics, the C simply represents a transformation of place. Um, that isn't a commodity. It's simply a time factor for somebody who's either producing or, 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 or purchasing mm -hmm. goods. That is, comes across the ocean and eventually gets to them mm -hmm. and put it on the market. So if you don't have a commodity, then MCM prime becomes simply M M prime, which is speculation. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between the logistics economy and speculation? Well, one of the arguments that I make in the book is that what's remarkable about um, the growth of and the importance of logistics in temporary capitalism is that the innovations in logistics have contributed to the ability for investors to make speculative investments, right, in these in these different uh, in these different commodities. I'm not sure that I understand what you mean by the C is the place. Right? 
Um, so if you could clarify that, that would be useful. Well, I mean, you know, the people, the workers who work in the, in, in the industry there, say truck drivers, not truck drivers, mm -hmm. you, 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 you take this, uh, the, the goods from, from your barn to your mm -hmm. And see, producing that change in place, which ostensibly becomes a change in the value of the goods that you're transforming, mm -hmm. but it's not really a transformation of the goods. Mm -hmm. So it's in that sense that there's no commodity in MCM Prime there for logistics itself. Yeah, so one of the, I, I see what you're saying. So one of the things that I argue in the book is that so much of, um, you know, and maybe it was a mistake to write this, um, but so much of the discussion around and one of the interventions that I make in the book is that I write about logistics as an important part of capitalism, modern capitalism. Because so much of the work around um, deindustrialization has been focused on the sort of dismantling of production and is focused on production. And logistics, for the most part, is excluded from any kind of uh, analysis of, okay, what is the role of logistics in the production of place? Or why is there such a focus on production? Uh, and only production as understanding how you know this leads to regional economies, right? So my interest in logistics is about saying, okay, not not sort of getting into those old arguments, right? About whether it's you know where is the value added? You know, is it in production or, or circulation? Marx never finished volume three, right? Um, but the idea for me was about how these changes in sort of what's called total systems analysis, right? And how these companies like Walmart and Amazon are using logistics to really to outcompete their competitors, right? Sam Walton made this statement once about how it was the cross stock facility that I showed that allowed them to surpass Kmart in overall sales, right? And so at that point, it wasn't, it wasn't the production of the commodities that was being that was allowing these retailers to assume greater control. What it was is that they were able to uh, outcompete their, their, their competitors by getting stuff to market quicker. And by, in fact, transforming the entire retail economy by being able to match consumer desire with demand through new kinds of logistic systems. Um, and so my concern in that was instead of saying, OK, where is the value and all that stuff, my concern is like, why? How does that lead to our understanding of if the entire circuits of commodity circulation has changed because you have retailers, retailers like Amazon and Walmart depending on these new systems, right? That include massive warehouses or cross stock facilities. What does that mean for the transformation of urban space and digital economies? And that was the speculation about. Okay, well, we're gonna. You know, use and move this model. So that means that these kinds of warehouses are important to retailers. Retailers become an incredibly important part of, of modern capitalist society. And there's a, a, a tremendous amount of investment in these spaces in order for those companies to be able to succeed. It used to be that the producers defined everything. It used to be that the producers of the goods had the power, right, in these old uh, 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 push systems where the producer would say, I'm going to make this good uh, and I'm going to sell it, so I'm going to send it to the market and then I will recoup my profit once that turns over, right? That doesn't work that way anymore. What happens is now you get these retailers who are essentially telling the producers, you're going to make what we want you to make, when we want you to, when we want you to make it, and you're going to ship it where we want it to go, when we want it to go. So the entire relationship of production and distribution has shifted. So that you get now retailers who before used to just be intermediaries. Now they have a tremendous amount of power because they can create and control markets. Right? They have the ability to sell more products. And therefore, they have the ability to create more products through that impact. And that's only because of the development of the logistics economy. Exactly. That's the whole point of the book. <laughs> right? That, that's the whole point of the book. That there is this way in which we understand contemporary capitalism. Modern capitalism cannot be understood outside of these kinds of shifts in logistics. So the point is to how do those shifts in logistics then 
relate to what's going on in the ground in these spaces that become produced as spaces for logistics, right? So you get these warehouses that are serving this major, you know, circulation of capital. Um, they're part of it, right? Uh, and so my my whole sort of approach was to say, look, this is multi-scalar. Like, this isn't just about a warehouse being built in the middle of inland Southern California. This is about an entire sort of spatial order that's been one decimated, as sort of illustrated through the dismantling of the, of the Kaiser Mill, and replaced by a new order, which is a new order of logistics and distribution. Right? So the old manufacturing Keynesian economy gets replaced with this new kind of logistic-based economy. And that was an intentional investment that was made by regional leaders who invested heavily in poor infrastructure. And if that's the case, then the question is, then how are those decisions implicated in the production of racialized workplaces like I write about in these warehouses, right? I told you, it should have just been all question and answer. What was it doing? Because this is much better, yes. Yeah, I work with Paul Gary from, from Redfield, LA County. And half our projects were a news movement because the because way, way more positioned in Southern California were they out, out into the country. You, you, you go from Southern California to Arizona, to Texas, to the South. That's the big growth area. Yeah. The Bay Area, you go to Reno, that's it. Yeah. So that's why I think our corridors are a lot more, they're, they're a lot more private because a lot more business in the southern part of the country than the northern part of the country. Yeah. So one of the biggest problems we had in Metro was we were funding all these highway projects for trucks that are just going through our streets and making potholes, making all those things happen. And we're, we don't get any benefit. Plus, I worked they did a lot of organizing and making a lot of making parks happen. But you're, but you're competing against warehouse space with a park space. Mm -hmm. So if you want to build more warehouses, you get that money in there, but we need more parks along these corners too. Right. So it kind of puts us two positions of like, you know, how do you create an environment that yeah. can be both? Thank you, Jim, for giving me the entry point to talk about environmental justice. Um, yeah, so one of the things uh, that I write about in the book that I didn't talk about today is, you know, this idea of the public good, right? This idea that, uh, which is, you know, that the state should invest in these infrastructure programs in order to support further economic development. And it's sold as a public good, right? It's going to spur economic development. Well, so much of the investment in Southern California's transportation infrastructure has been about the support of logistics. It's been about the support of both rail, but largely, as been said, truck routes. And so, one of the things that is clear is that these trucks kill people, right? They're deadly. They have they emit PM 2.5 diesel exhaust. Just in those two counties that I'm looking at, more than 3,000 people a year die because of cancer cases related to diesel exhaust. So the logistics, logistics is, you know, when I talk about premature death in the book, it's not a metaphor. Um, the other thing about that is that it's sold as a public good as saying, look, we're supporting economic development and we're supporting good jobs. But if that state investment is also producing these kind of precarious racialized labor markets, then what the state is essentially doing as part of this larger argument that I make, it's a racial state, right? It's producing racialized labor markets and it's producing geographies of death that are putting poor people of color into you know these really precarious situations because it's exposing them to toxic fumes that are killing them. So that idea when we talk about and, and this is part of the challenge of the book, right? Like on so many levels, like development and infrastructure, we talk about it as a policy decision. And yet like if you think about how it manifests itself in concrete everyday life, these sort of really mundane policy conversations are rooted in these sort of geographies of race and class that have to be brought to the conversation. So how can you have a state that argues for investment in transportation infrastructure as a public good, right, when part of that public is being killed, when part of that public is being produced as temporary low wage workforces? And it's clear at that point that those people are not part of the public. 
somehow they're excluded from the idea of who this economy is supposed to serve. And that is the part of when I talk about these workers are writing themselves into the narrative, mm -hmm. right? It's a simple sort of say, hey, we're here, we're part of that, we have to be considered in, as part of that conversation. Here and then down. Yeah, um, you're, you're sort of getting at this, but I'm I wanted to ask you to be um, more explicit on two things. One, one is, okay, you've, you've given us this very rich, wonderful description of the labor process in the logistics sector and um, how it all fits together. What do you see as the points of leverage for change from an organizing perspective? That's number one. I know that's hard. And here's the even harder one, which I always ask activists turns academic, activists turned academics. And that is, how does your work support that? Or, yeah, or that good change? questions, good questions. Um, well, I think the question about where are the leverage points, um, one of the, the, the field work that I did for this started in 2000 and Part of it, working with the warehouse campaign, which is when it began as a campaign, I think it was in late 2007, um, when they actually started organizing and thinking about organizing and investing money in, in this campaign that led to this. And this is the Warehouse Workers United campaign. Um, we know very little about how to win in terms of organizing in this industry, right? And you get people who are saying, wow, logistics is the major port of leverage. You stop, you stop the trucks, you stop the, the warehouse, and you stop the whole circulation of capital. Um, how to actually do that is the difficult part, uh, and especially in a region which is really conservative. Right? So Inland Empire, um, remember that chart, the demographic chart that I had up there? Um, that doesn't match with the kind of political landscape. right? So even though the demographics have changed, it continues to be a mostly Republican, really conservative beside Republican, and almost all white elected leadership in the region. Right? Um, so the normal strategies that unions are using now, which is public leverage, all that stuff, didn't work. After a year and a half of them trying all their, you know, the unions trying all of their strategies around leveraging policy, all that, they said, we tried policy, we tried high road, we tried the legal strategy, we tried all these, and we finally decided that we just have to organize the workers. Um, and the problem with that is that they only wanted to organize the workers for six months or a year. And then it was too expensive, and then they went on to the next thing. Right? Um, so part of the reason, and one of the arguments that I make in the book, is that you, there has to be a regional approach to organizing. Right? Like what happened in LA with the kind of progressive change that took place in LA didn't happen in five years, didn't happen in 10 years. It was like a 20 year to 30 year period of time that you got organizations who were able to build their power uh, and then can finally influence politics and elect people to then push their policies. Right? Um, so that was one of the strategies. So it was interesting because unions in this region had really been you know, ignored, community organizations, et cetera, hadn't been involved in progressive political uh, politics, hadn't been involved in immigrant politics at all, right? And it was only until this campaign that these unions started to become spokes, you know, organizations for the immigrants' rights campaign and start to get involved. And so it was really like a regional, it was a spatial strategy, right? Let's organize the region. And that's why I meant when I talked about, like, they weren't just talking about themselves or their warehouses, they were talking about the entire conservative sort of racial landscape of the region that needed to be transformed. Um, and so there, the, the quick answer is that there is no quick answer, right? I think there has to be that kind of commitment and investment in the long-term regional organizing. Um, how does my work in, uh, affect? So one of the things that I continue to be involved in in this, uh, uh, I was telling the fellows earlier that uh, we don't have good data. And remember I talked about how the workers are not included in the official metrics for measuring logistics? Um, 
So one of the things that we're trying to get, uh, and when I say we, is me as a researcher, but also this, this organization is interested in getting, is more detailed information about how many temporary how many temporary workers work in warehouses. The way the data is collected right now is just all temporary workers are counted as an industry. And so we want to know how many of those temporary temporary workers are actually working in the field of logistics. And the data that is available right now doesn't tell us that, right? Uh, and this would be helpful for a number of different reasons in terms of organizing, and the unions wanted that. Um, and so we figured out, okay, this is the data that they collect, uh, and so let's meet with the EDD, and let's ask for this data, because we know they have it, right? Uh, and then we talk about what we do with that data. So it's a constant relationship, uh, I think, as a researcher. Are they going to read this book? No, probably not, right? Do they care about any of the art? Maybe, right? Um, so I see my academic work as like this stuff, as important to them if they want to read it, but much more important, I think, is the sort of ongoing, long-term relationships where we talk about, you know, what kind of information, how is this information useful to you, that is not necessarily going into the realm of academic work. Although they did say that they bought through Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. Oh, wait, were you next? Sorry. Oh, okay. I finally did need a moderator. Thanks. Thank you both for letting me ask questions. Uh, so I, I was really curious. There was a, an earlier question about your pre existing constructions of space yeah. being important for why this took place. And I'm really curious about pre existing constructions of race in uh -huh. geography. So, why this takes place in the Southwest, in particular, in California? Um, and obviously, I'm thinking with uh, like Molina's work or Nina's uh, work, uh, thinking about these kind of agricultural landscapes yeah. that are already, and big ag that's already producing uh, you know, racialized labor um, and, and unequal uh, status in these same geographies that are maybe a sort of first step. For this to take place. I'm curious as to how you read that. Yeah, and I talk about that uh, in, in part of the book where I talk about the development of the Sketchers Warehouse in Moreno Valley. Mm -hmm. um, and Moreno Valley uh, has been you know, one of the sites of. So I talk about how part of the transformation to this logistics landscape involved um, county legislators and cities transforming agricultural land into land that was suitable for development of warehouses and housing. Because housing is the other big industry in that region. Um, and so one of the things that, um, yes, that's absolutely clear. That history of the citrus industry, citrus economy, the kind of racialized labor landscape, that is what is embedded and entrenched in that kind of racialized politics that I talked about, right? That kind of white, very conservative, uh, reactionary sort of uh, political landscape is tied to those old relationships of, of landowners and agricultural workers of the citrus industry and other industries. Um, so that is true. What's so what's difficult in that comparison is that the population just explodes, right? And there's so much transformation, so many new relationships of power that are being negotiated. What stays the same is those who control the political power, right? And that old land movement. And so there's a, a chapter in which I talk about this developer who wants to develop the Skechers warehouse, um, and they uh, are being opposed by these white landowners who want to maintain their horses. This equestrian land class. Um, and so they're saying, no, this is harmful, this is damaging, we want to maintain this rural, agricultural, idyllic landscape, right? Um, and, and then the developer works a deal out with local Latino sort of politicians and brings in buses of immigrant workers in, from, from the region to say, we need these jobs, we want these warehouses. And so there's a way in which those historical relationships between landowners 
and that sort of that were shaped by that kind of agricultural past are being remade as well, aside from the industrial things that I've been talking about with the Kaiser, right? Um, the Kaiser Mill. That those relationships of power and those kind of patronage relationships where you get these developers now relying on the growing Latinx population to say, we need these jobs. At the same time that these warehouse workers are saying, these jobs are, you know, one, killing us because they're poisoning in our community, and two, exposing us to consistent, to chronic poverty. And so that kind of mix is powerful, right? Um, because what happens is that there is this way in which that landed elite, that old sort of agricultural landed elite and those circuits of power uh, are reproducing themselves by tapping into the growing Latinx population and shifting the way in which Latinx politics and identity formation is taking place. That's, that's, that's Did you want to? Uh, sure. So I think uh, you're making a huge intervention here by focus, focusing us on these contingent workers in the relig religious field. And it seems like those academics who, who work on that you know, similar population of workers focus on service uh, workers. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if you could just talk through a little bit about where you see the points of continuity or difference in terms of uh, yeah, that was really deliberate because you know the narrative of the LA school, right? Like post uh, post industrial LA, the grow, the rise of immigrants and the rise of Latin, Latin, Latinos and Latinas, and it's the rise of the service sector economy. And then there's a massive investment in organizing those service sector workers, the janitors and the hotel workers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so my intervention here was very deliberate to say, I want to talk about this stuff, and I want to talk about Latinx workers, but I don't want to talk about service sector workers, because I do want to talk about production, and I do want to talk about different circuits of capital, right? Um, and so, it's, one, I think it's, you know, more and more people are beginning to write about it, um, but it's still a pretty small segment of the, sort of the literature that's out there. Um, and, and I think, the way that I sort of reconcile or write about that is the kind of hyper-rationalization of logistics is prime you know, like, you know, material for the hyper-dependency on contingent worker, right? That's sort of, you know, if you think about old Taylorist models, right, of like trying to measure movements, that stuff is there everywhere because of these technologies. Yeah, and it seems like kind of similar in some ways to an Uber driver, exactly. but very different from a nanny, right? I mean, it seems like there's maybe a continuity of... Right. Probably because, I mean, partially it's because it's part of this, this circuit where it's not delivering a service. I don't think it's delivering a service. I think it's actually adding value to the circulation because it's so much of it is dependent on that market um, penetration, right? And so... So what's interesting to me about this, this, this industry and this reliance on contingent workers is that essentially uh, in conjunction with the kind of debate on immigration, these temporary agencies become ways for these major global retailers to funnel workers, undocumented workers into their workforce. Um, Walmart has an e verified certification, right? So they say, we as a corporation do not hire undocumented workers. You go into their warehouses, undocumented workers everywhere, but they're not the technical employers, right? They're just subcontracted workers through these temp agencies. So these temp agencies play really key roles as racialized labor producers and purveyors of racialized labor by being able to tap into these workers uh, and feed them into these large circuits, right? Um, so yeah, I, I think it's different and it was intentional to focus on these. My main interest was also to think about what is it about this industry that makes contingent work such a prominent part of, an important part of how that was produced. Okay. So we can stay well, we can stay here. So thank you so much, Colin. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, we will stay. We can wrangle, have a formal conversation, and also go eventually up, up to the balcony and enjoy the weather. Thank you.
Thank you.